Hi, Mark Gilbert here. Thanks for clicking in. This video is entitled, Your Thinking and Health. It's part of a series where we're looking at the Ernest Holmes book, The Basic Ideas of Science of Mind. And like all the videos on this channel, they're designed to give you some tools and ideas for assisting with our spiritual evolution. Now, even though this is the second in a series of videos that we're looking at uh, the Holmes book, The Basic Ideas of Science of Mind, you don't have to have watched the other videos and you don't have to be reading the book in order to benefit from this video although it would be beneficial. But this video does stand alone and gives you some key concepts from the chapter two of the book and what we're going to be talking about and what I see as the four key critical points that Holmes wants to make in this chapter on thinking and health is that first off the power of our subjective mind and what exactly that means. Secondly, that our bodies are being refreshed and continuously updated as they live in a flow within this material universe. And the third point is that there's evidence around us all the time about the mind-body connection if we would look and observe it. And the fourth point is that there is a technique that we can follow that we'll outline in this video that allows you to start manifesting the highest expression of your physical health if you build on this practice. So that's where we're going over the next couple of minutes. Holmes begins his chapter on thinking and health by reminding us of the three characteristics of divine mind or God or spirit, that essence in which we live and move and have our being. Divine mind or big mind has three key characteristics. The first is a conscious awareness, the ability to consciously choose our thoughts. The second is something called subjective mind, which acts upon our thoughts to third create the manifest or physical world. So spirit, God, mind has characteristics of conscious awareness, subjective mind which creates, and the physical world. Now this is really all one mind and Holmes reminds us in this chapter that we only divide this out so that we can understand how it works and employ it at a better level in our lives. In the discussion of using the power of thought for health, Holmes wants to stress the role of subjective mind in creating our health. To that degree he writes the following, subjective means under the direction of, and this is true concerning that portion of mind which acts as law, the creative, obedient, formative power. Subjective means it doesn't choose itself, it receives and just acts upon it normally. When I first heard the term law in regards to subjective mind, it was confusing to me. I tended to want to use the idea of, of law that I came to the teaching with, which was a series of laws that are written by societies and governments that control our behavior. That's not what he's talking about. When he uses the word law in relation to subjective mind, he's really equating it more to like the use of the word law in scientific laws, like Newton's law of gravity or the law of thermodynamics. When we look at it from a scientific standpoint, the word law basically says, we've done a lot of observations that we've noticed that if we ever do this, that there is something that always acts in the same manner and produces this that A is acted upon continuously by some law to produce B. And that's the same thing that he is saying. We can think of it in terms of if I take a, an object and I hold it up and I let it go, the law of gravity is continuously going to flow it down to the ground. So we can act and see that over and over. We don't know what this is, but we call it a law, the law of gravity. Similarly, he says that there is a law that acts upon our thoughts that whatever we tend to believe is what we get manifested. So you can tend to think of holding a thought, a belief, and then finding the manifestation on the ground. That this law acts in the same manner, that it's always taking our beliefs and creating and manifesting what it is we believe. Now, we can argue with that when we first come to the science of mind because we can say, well, I believe this and did not always get what I wanted. And the reason for that is, which he describes in this chapter as well, is that we have inconsistent thoughts. If I think I'm going to be healthy, I'm going to be healthy. But if I think I'm going to be healthy, and then I think I'm not going to be healthy, and then I think I'm going to be healthy, and then I think I'm not going to be healthy, if I've got these inconsistent pattern, the law is continuously acting upon it, 
but it's manifesting inconsistent results. And so that's something to keep in mind that one of the key things in science of mind is to start building healthy patterns of thought which are consistent. He talks about having an expectancy, an expectancy of the good, expectancy of health. So how does this subjective law create our physical health? To this degree, Holmes writes the following. In considering the creation of health by right thinking, we also need to realize that it's through law that the body is built and maintained. It keeps us breathing, keeps our hearts beating, takes care of our temperature, circulates the blood, digests our food, eliminates refuse, and does everything which keeps the marvelously intricate machinery of the body in operation. Now, if you think about that, all of our body's mechanisms are continuously acting without our conscious awareness. And that's what he's pointing out is that there is a natural action of our body to maintain a homeostasis and health. And it's done without us consciously thinking. And he says that's an example of subjective mind acting upon our physical health. He gives another example too, and that's in regards to what we term habits. He writes the following. There's a second way, however, in which law is of exceedingly great value. A habit is the result of something we have done with careful attention and conscious effort so many times that we do not now have to think specifically about it when doing it. That is, the law of mind responds to a persistent idea and automatically maintains it. This we call habit. We've all got these habits. You know, we can think back to the example if, you, if you've learned to drive a car, that when you were first learning, you were consciously aware of what you were doing and it made you overcompensate and nervous. But at a certain point, you developed a habit for the flow for driving so that your conscious mind could actually leave and you could subconsciously drive that car. There are many things that we do like that that are habits that we have built the conscious intentions and patterns so deeply ingrained within us as by the nature of a habit that it becomes subjective and it becomes like a like an automatic computer uh, routine that is just run continuously within us without us consciously having to intervene in it. So that's two ways, the natural homeostasis of our bodies and the development of habits that we no longer think about where our subjective mind is acting upon something in a continuous flow to maintain. maintain. The second key point from this chapter in my mind is Holmes wants us to see that our bodies are continuously being remade so that we start beginning to sense the fluid nature of them. To this degree he writes this, we all know that in the process of living millions of body cells are being replaced daily. Millions of new cells are constantly growing within our bodies and they immediately take on the atmosphere of the surroundings in which they find themselves. The atmosphere or tone of the body may be considered as wholesome, happy, optimistic, and therefore healthy, or the opposite, gloomy, apprehensive, frightened, fearful, anxious, discouraged, weak, and sickly. This atmosphere is the sum total of the way we are allowing ourselves to think and feel. Now, what he's getting at here is that and what I'm taking from this is that we tend to think of these bodies as some sort of constant physical item. We forget about the fact that every day we're taking in food, we're taking in water and beverages, we're taking in oxygen through breathing, and there's a continuous elimination of waste out of our bodies that these bodies are not static. They're in a continuous flow. Skin cells are continuously being formed and others are being died off. Every aspect of our body dies and is being replaced on a continuous flow. So when we want to remember that our power of our thinking can change something, if we tend to think of our bodies as some sort of concrete item that's hard to change, then it's going to be more difficult for us to have that expectancy that our thoughts can create health within these forms. But when we remember that these forms are in a continuous state of flow, that they're continuously being replaced, that there is a universe that is flowing through it both in the physical matter of, of uh, food and, and water and so forth, but there's also an energy flow that is moving through us that we are continuously being physically replaced all the time. This fluid nature of our bodies and remembering it allows us to have a deeper expectancy that our thinking can change our bodies and bring on health where we may be experiencing disease.
The next point that Holmes makes is that there's plenty of evidence all around us of the interplay between mind and body. Now, in this particular chapter of the book, he uses some medical sources that he quotes that are evidence of how our minds can impact our health and our physical bodies. Now, given that this book is about 60 years old, obviously the medical references are a little bit dated. But if you wish to get a more recent listing, what I suggest you do is go online and Google the term mind-body connection. I did that just recently, and there is a lot of different websites out there that will give you some information about the various interplay and evidence of how the power of our minds and the power of our thoughts can have a physical impact. But one example that I wanted to cite here that I think would be really relevant for us is the description of something that we tend to take for granted, and that's the so-called placebo effect. Now, we're all familiar with the placebo effect because it's referenced in terms of our medical trials. Whenever a new drug is being brought to market, they're uh, required to check the drug, to check its um, efficacy against uh, a sugar pill. Now, what we tend to, you know, wash away and not think about is the fact that why is it that this group over here, this thousand that took just the sugar pill, why is it that there's always a percentage of them who will have improvements in health based on taking the pill? It's because there is a recognized impact on the very nature that the belief that you're taking something that's going to have an improvement in your health is going to lead to an improvement in your health. In other words, a placebo is something that is showing the power of our thoughts to affect our health and improve our health. So now we come to the final point of the chapter, which is the practical application of the ideas we've been discussing. Holmes outlines a short process that we can use each day to shift our thinking to have an expectancy of health so that we can then manifest health in these physical bodies of ours. All of this is built upon the concepts that have been developed through our thinking about them to this point. That is, recognizing that below our level of awareness is the subjective mind that is continuously maintaining these bodies in homeostasis, that has taken our habits and ingrained them into us so that they became a pattern that we continuously use for manifesting things in our life. That there is ample evidence that this physical form that we live in is not a concrete form, but is something that is fluid in nature and is continuously replacing its material nature on a routine schedule. And that there's plenty of evidence around us for the interplay between mind and body, such as the placebo effect. If we can accept all of this, that the power of our thinking and directing our thinking and creating thoughts in a manner that directs this physical form of ours to shift into the greatest and highest expression of health, then how do we do that? Well, Holmes outlines the process which I'm just going to read verbatim to you. He writes, the following simple procedures practiced daily in a persistent, happy, and expectant manner will soon produce a good effect upon your health. Night and morning, try to set aside a time in which to be quiet to commune with your real self, that is to fill into that God spirit essence within you. This is really the period in which you clarify your mental atmosphere. Be as relaxed physically as you can, but neither the position you occupy in the chair in which you sit nor the room has anything to do with the work you're doing. Merely see to it that there is no physical discomfort while you are attempting to direct your thinking. You know, there's a lot of times we start to think that Spiritual practices or practices like this have to be harder than they are. And what Holmes is inviting you to do is it's a simple matter of just relaxing into a chair and thinking about that spirit or God essence or nature that's within you. Get into that state of relaxation. He says, now that some of the body tenseness, which is the bane of our rushing way of living, has been released, say with conviction and feeling the following, I am strong and free through the action of God in me. I am well and successful in everything I do. Let me repeat that. I am strong and free through the action of God in me. I am well and successful in everything I do. He goes on to repeat, 
this until you feel the thrill of it all through you. It is a wonderful tonic. The key point he's making here is there's an affirmation, a positive statement that basically says, I am healthy. I am healthy. I know that I am healthy. I am strong and free and through the action of God in me, I'm well and successful in everything that I do. It's an affirmation that you're building until you have an emotional feeling connected with it. Because it's not so much just simply saying the words, there has to be the belief developed. And the belief comes with the feeling, the emotional feeling that comes with it. He goes on to say, after this, spend 10 minutes thinking over some part of what you've read, assimilating it more, or have a quiet prayer time in which you do not ask for things or conditions, but name them. Accept them as already belonging to you and give thanks for you. You're not asking for intercedence by some external God. You're simply claiming the goodness that's already there within you. You're stating it in a manner that has emotions attached to it. You're feeling it at the deep essence of who you are. And you're claiming it. You're building that great expectancy within you. A simple process. It's asking you to take 10 to 20 minutes of your day for you to sit in relaxed state and to claim your nature and have thanks for the goodness that's in your life. That practice each day and building on that practice is going to bring you good health. You've got to practice, practice, practice. Develop the habit of having expectancy that you are in good health. If you are in any kind of dis-ease at this point in time, turn away from that condition, see your body as healthy, and maintain a conscious awareness that health is flowing through your body. Remember that your body is in a continuous state of flow and change and that the power of your thinking can direct yourself to good health. All of this is not to say don't use appropriate medical care as appropriate. Obviously the benefits of Western medical care and any other holistic treatment can be beneficial for you, but it is to supplement it with the power of your thinking. But there's great power in your thoughts and you too can have perfect health. Till next time. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. There's a similar video right here next to my face if you want to click on it. Also, if you want to get notifications of future videos, be sure to hit that subscribe button on the bottom left-hand corner. If you'd like to contact me, email me at the address on the screen or drop me a comment in the comment field below on YouTube. Thanks.